like to uh, welcome all of you this morning to our session on outsider art. Uh, for this uh, uh, distinguished subject, we have two insiders who will be speaking to us uh, today on the topic, uh, uh, Rick McCaslin and uh, Jay Wainert. Rick will uh, go first. Richard B. McCaslin, as he is more properly known, uh, will speak on a uh, specific artist from the outside, Pompeo Luigi Cupini, who was born in the town of Moglia in Mantua in Italy in 1870. Rick is the Texas State Historical Association Endowed Professor of Texas History at the University of North Texas. He has written or edited 18 books, seven of which have won awards. His biography of Robert E. Lee was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. His most recent book has the intriguing subtitle, Saratoga on the Cibolo. It deals with the once thriving resort of Sutherland Springs on Cibolo Creek, south of, uh, south of here, and earlier this year received a publications award from the San Antonio Conservation Society. Rick is a fellow of the Texas State Historical Association and an admiral in the Texas Navy. He has uh, commendations from the Civil War Roundtables in Dallas, Fort Worth, and Shreveport for his academic work on the Civil War era. Please welcome Rick McCaslin. I'm going to do a test fly on the technology here real quick. By golly. Magic. Thank you all for coming. Good to see a lot of old friends, familiar faces. Makes it a little more comfortable up here for me. Wow, what a voice. I have to do this for one of my classes, too, and I still don't like my voice, but at least I can hear it. <laughs> We're going to talk this morning about outsider art is patriot art, if I could just roughly paraphrase the title, which kind of threw me for a loop when I first saw it, because outsider art, but Capini produced over 75 public installations in 12 different states and three countries. Um, in his day, he was far from an outsider, but then I thought about it and I thought, he is definitely an outsider in definitions of the modern art movement, which he decried and criticized in no uncertain terms, bordering on strident. And he also was not a fan of regionalism, which led him to conflicts with such leading regionalists as J. Frank Doby and his group of artists. Um, funny thing is, though, Capini would graciously judge competitions here in San Antonio and other places, which included lots of pictures of blue bonnets and longhorns, etc. So he could, for short periods of time, be very gracious. But there was nobody who loved Capini more than Capini. And I think he would be quite pleased with the session because it does come around to the point he was trying to make. He thought that in his work, he was trying to create, or did create, a pantheon of American heroes. He was promoting patriotism. Now, what we modern scholars look at his work and discover is that he was doing something else that he may or may not have been truly aware of. He was helping redefine Texas in the 20th century. Texas comes into the 20th century very Confederate, very cotton south. Yes, we had some oil exploding out of the ground at Spindletop. We had some longhorns going up the trails. But generally speaking, Texas was still very southern, which our progressive leaders decided would not sell in the money markets of the north or the west or the midwest or overseas. So in the teens, they began to redefine us as western, as a story of American civilization moving west. Hence the pantheon of revolutionary heroes, and Capini will be one of the leading people who produces that set of icons for us, and thus will redefine Texas by the time of the centennial, right light, <laughs> as a western state rather than southern. So who is this guy, and why is he doing what he does? He is an Italian-born in a small town in northern Italy. His dad was a railroad um, engineer, not one that drives the trains, one that fixes the rails. He wanted his son to have a real job. The son didn't want to have a real job. So back and forth they argued until finally young Capini ran away from home at the age of 16 and his dad made a deal with him when he got him dragged back. I'll let you go to art school in Florence 
And when you decide you hate it, and you will, then you're going to come home and go to engineering school. Well, Capini landed down there, finished the seven-year program in three years with honors. That did not work out well for Dad. He studied under a guy there named Augusto Revolta, and here's his defining moment of what made him who he was. Revolta did an entire set of famous statues in Italy based on historical figures of Italian separatism and unification. So what young Capini was taught to do was very neo-Renaissance style, classic style statuary in the classic materials of bronze and marble that would, as his mentor said, not only be pleasing to the eye, but tell a story. And the story that his mentor drilled into his head is if it does not tell the tale, the history of a people, the tale of a nation, then you have not produced something that is of great worth at all. So with that in mind, Capini graduates and ends up on the streets of Rome, odd jobs, making busts of rich people or copies of old Greek and Roman statues for pennies on the dollar. Hates it, decides he's going to leave the country, comes to New York, lands on the docks with 40 bucks in his pocket, quickly realizes that he might want to learn English. That was a big obstacle. Um, some of the people who had been there before had already learned English and gotten networked. He starts doing pretty well, though. He gets the attention of the people who run the Roman Bronze Works and gets this contract. This is the Francis Scott Key Memorial in Frederick, Maryland. Um, that is his work down at the bottom. The lady sitting, he's part of a small team of people who did this, but it makes his name. It also gets him married. The lady who posed for the image at the bottom, that's Elizabeth Barberi soon to be Mrs. Pompeo Capini, and they will remain married for the rest of their lives. So he gets a paycheck and a wife out of his first big job. <laughs> not bad. He's not happy, though. He feels like he's being excluded. So suddenly, the Roman Bronze Works, friend of his, gets a call from Texas. There's a German-born stonecutter named Frank Teich in San Antonio has a huge project to do a Confederate memorial out in front of the Texas Capitol. This is about 1900, 1901. Um, Teich is a stone cutter, I'll repeat. He has no clue how to manage bronze. Bronze is what the committee wants for the Jeff Davis statue on top. So they tell him, you gotta go hire a good bronze guy. So he contacts the best bronze works he knows in the country, that would be Roman bronze works. They were doing Remington stuff, they were doing Russell stuff, uh, some of Tiffany's work was coming out of there. Their records, by the way, are up at Eamon Carter Museum in Fort Worth these days. And they, he asked, a guy named Richard, well, who have you got? And he said, I got this young Italian guy. He works cheap. He works fast. Tice said, perfect. Send him down. So Capini climbs on a train, gets off the train in San Antonio looking for gunfighters. You know, he wants to see cowboys. He was actually very enamored of San Antonio. It looked very European. He goes to work for Teich. It must have been a wonderful interview. Teich said, so how long will it be till you get me a clay model? Stage one. Capini said, oh, about two or three weeks. Teich looks at him and says, that's not possible. Capini said, yeah, it's possible. You know, training on the streets of Rome, knocking out cheap statues fast. That'll make you good. So Teich says, all right, let's see what you got, kid. Two weeks later, Capini calls him over to the studio, and by golly, there's a Jeff Davis. In fact, it's such a good Jeff Davis that the committee tells Teich at that point, we don't want your stone statues on the corners. We want this kid's bronze statues. <laughs> so in less than nine months, Capini knocks out five bronzes, one for each corner, and he's made his name in Texas, where he decides to stay a while, and he does become the darling of the local heritage groups. They are enamored of his Confederate statue, and therefore it's UDC, S, um, United Confederate Veterans, and veterans organizations such as Terry's Texas Rangers and Hood's Texas Brigade that will provide his main living for the next 10 or 12 years. Starts with this one, of course, and then he'll bounce over to Paris, Texas. This is where he did four bronze um, busts and of course a soldier image. This shows another transition in his work. He was very interested in portraying the common soldier. 
the common American at war. Um, he really decried the robot type statues you would get out of companies in Marietta, Georgia or St. Louis. And so he tried to make these very naturalistic, one of the first examples. Then of course, George Littlefield and his crew are very impressed with what's going on. So they hire him to do an equestrian statue, which is just a happy moment for an Italian sculptor. Apparently an equestrian statue is just the coolest thing ever. And he will always be looking for contracts for equestrian statues. It's very interesting. Now remember you have to do this in clay first. Then you build a skeleton of whatever materials you have. Not just of the horse and the rider, but the two separately. They're to be joined later. Then you build up clay around the skeleton. Then you build up clothes. You, you work on them naked first. We'll see some examples later. You do this layer by layer. I mean, one of your training points is you went to the local hospital and watched as they dissected cadavers. It's very, very much like da Vinci and the Neo and the, and the Renaissance artists. Of course, if Terry Texas Rangers has a very good statue, by golly, Hood's Texas Brigade needs one. Actually, they upset Capini. They hired him, then they found out how much he wanted, $10,000. So they walked away, hired another fellow, when it arrived from Chicago, that bronze, one leg was shorter than the other, the gun was crooked, and it looked like crap. They wouldn't even unload it from the railroad car. That's when Littlefield goes back to Capini and said, would you, I know we hurt your feelings, we, we're sorry, would you do it for us? And Capini does this one for them. Again, this is Hutch Texas Brigade. Then, of course, Palestine wants their native son, John H. Reagan memorialized. This is an interesting piece in that it's one of the few times Capini actually returns to Italy to get a piece cast. All these other have been showing you, Roman bronze works. This was done by a foundry in Rome, maybe simply because it was a time to go home and see the old folks one more time, see the old home place. I love this seat at the bottom. My students think this is Gollum. It is not Gollum. But if you tell an Italian classic sculptor, we want an image that portrays the lost cause, what would do better than a defeated Roman legionnaire, right? That's what that is. So if you go with your grandkids, explain to them, please, it's not Gollum. But it's what you would get if you told an Italian, this is what we need. My favorite, this is called The Last in Line. This is in Victoria, Texas. Again, paid for by the local United Daughters of the Confederacy. Um, this is supposed to be a Confederate soldier at the very end of the war. He's got no food, no blankets. Most of his clothing is torn. He's wounded. But by God, he's standing firm. He's got 40 rounds and a rifle, and he's still ready to continue the war. It's called the last in line or the firing line, either one. Um, you can tell if you're looking close, if you're a good gun collector or know a little bit. Our artist does not know a damn thing about guns. He's an artist, not a gun guy. So yes, that is an 1873 model trapdoor Springfield in the hands of the model. He wouldn't know it's a gun and it's old. Some people always like to point that out in the Q&A, so I'm heading you off. Got that. Um, my favorite story about this, I went to see this. I was giving a talk at UH Victoria, very gracious to have me. And I went looking for this, couldn't find it. Asked several people. They said, we don't have a Confederate statue. I finally asked the right guy. And I was talking in the post office. I was in the police department. The usual places where people might know where things are. And a guy said, you mean our Minuteman statue? I said, yeah, <laughs> that's what I want to see. So even though this has a UDC marker on the back of it, apparently in public memory, this has been rebranded as a Revolutionary War statue. So if you're worried about them taking it down, not anytime soon. And then another one that people don't know is a Confederate monument. This is a little odd. You'll notice this is not bronze. The UDC of Corpus Christi wanted something to decorate their new seawall. So they approached Capini. Capini said, 10,000. They said, we don't have that. They said, how much do you have? They said, 1,500. He said, sorry. Well, he's a Rotarian and a Scottish Rite Mason. So the UDC of Corpus Christi cheated. They got their Rotarian and Scottish Rite Mason husbands to talk to Capini, and he agreed to do this cast concrete piece, which is called 
um, City of the Sea, but it's actually a UDC monument to the Confederacy, a little out of the ordinary for him. So he's established a pretty good reputation. Universities like him. He did the Rufus Burleson at Baylor. And even though his equestrian contract with Waco fell through for a Saul Ross statue, that was going to be a doozy, slashing with his sword and killing Yankees. That would have stood. He did a Saul Ross for A&M. Any Aggies in here used to lay pennies? Yeah, well, Capini. You can thank Capini, 1919. His big masterpiece in some ways is going to be the Littlefield Fountain, and that's named for George Littlefield, who paid him a quarter million dollars to do it. Now, this is a project that took over 15 years as they argued over what it was to be. Littlefield wanted a Confederate monument. Capini, particularly after World War I, wanted a World War I monument. Ultimately, Capini's um, model won out, mainly because Littlefield died. And if you die, pretty much you lose the argument, right? <laughs> He's got your money, and he doesn't have to listen to you anymore. So Capini had this idea of an outdoor cathedral. What you would do is you would walk up to the central monument, which is to the boys from World War I who went to UT plus their associates. On each side would be the stages of the South reentering the Union. Lee and Johnson, as you came by, they're the, the guys of the Civil War era. The New South people would be um, Hogg and Reagan, James Stephen Hogg and Reagan. And then as you approached the plinths in the back, that would be Woodrow Wilson and Jeff Davis, the president of the Confederacy and the first Southern Democratic president of the reunited country that won World War I. In other words, like if you went in a European cathedral and walked by the stained glass windows. Um, unfortunately for him, Paul Kret, the architect of UT, has the ear of the regents, and it got disassembled. You may know, the statues stand out back while the fountain itself stands alone today. There's Capini working on one of his mermen. If you ever wonder what those things are, they're mermen. Capini actually in 1928, when he knew he was losing the argument and knew his piece was going to be disassembled and would not tell the message he wanted to tell, he said in 1928, there will come a time when people do not understand what I was trying to do. They won't like it and they will take it down. He was right, wasn't he? So, these are the statues that have been taken down. Um, I understand Hogg is back up, but they're not, I haven't been on campus to see. Davis is part of an exhibit in the uh, Dolph Briscoe Center for American History, and the others, I have no idea where they are. The Lee statue, by the way, was his, one of his favorites, one of Capini's favorites. Meanwhile, Capini will, of course, produce one for Baylor University as part of the centennial of R.E.B. Baylor. If you ever walk down through the central campus, you'll see that. And the last public statue he ever installed was for a university in Texas. And that was the George Washington at UT Austin that they're now discussing removing. There are times when he works out of his heart. That was the Galveston flood piece. I just noticed there's a new article yesterday about restoring this. They're not going to have a good time restoring it because you can't find it. UT lost it. I'm kind of puzzled. What happened is he was commissioned by the city council of Galveston to produce this, and he produced what it is. It's a very dramatic, very sad sculpture. This, oh, come on back. I don't have a pointer. Anyway, if you see a hand coming up, that's her drowning husband. Now, J.P. Bryan and others will argue with me that that's a dead baby. What I do know is when he presented this plaster to the city council of Galveston, they said, we can't put that on the seawall. That's too sad. We want people to come to the beach and have a good time. Oh, my God. So it was never cast in bronze. He took the plaster, put a thin coating of bronze over it, donated it with another 20 or 30 at Littlefield's expense to UT Austin in 1913. They've all disappeared. But before you yell too much at UT, Baylor can't find the 20 or 30 he gave them in 1942 either. So... You know, there's a lot of people must have some pretty awesome plaster or semi-bronze statues in their rose gardens around Texas is all I can say. There was this story, too. If you ever go to Ballinger, 
This is a rich ranching family. Charles Noya's father wanted to memorialize his son who was killed in a horse riding accident. And so Capini did that statue as just simply a gift to the family. Now, of course, not for free. But the family, unfortunately, or fortunately for us, had moved away from the ranch by the time he completed this, and they donated the statue, and it now stands on the square in Ballinger, Texas. This is Charlie. And he was done simply because the family wanted to memorialize a lost son who died way too young. Meanwhile, Capini is getting quite a reputation, isn't he? People are looking out for him. People are talking to him. He doesn't work terribly expensively. These are about $10,000 a piece. The state of Texas begins to think in the progressive era, we want to reimage ourselves. We want to be somebody else. We don't want to be a Confederate state. We don't, don't want to be linked to that legacy. We want people to think of us as the West, the frontier, an American story. Who shall we get to create our icons for us? Capini. So the first project, 1910, he did the statue at the Come and Take It site in Gonzales. By the way, this is Caddy Corner across from a Frank Teich a Confederate monument. Compare them sometimes. Teich is going to come off the loser. Capini and Teich hated each other, by the way. Teich never got over being dissed by the committee. Now, why does he do the Sam Houston monument in granite? Because the legislature required it. And he screamed like a little kid for at least a year before he finally settled down. They required the statue be done, the monument be done in Texas granite. And so Capini complied. But he wasn't happy about it. You'll notice he did the Stephen F. Austin in bronze. Love this statue. Notice the salute. And that's what it is, guys. The docents have a hard time with this one. Why is Stephen F. Austin going Sieg Heil at the state capitol? Um, this is the Bellamy salute. This was the official salute that school kids all over America from the 1890s until 1942 gave when they were doing the Pledge of Allegiance. So when Capini put this up, he has Stephen F. Austin saluting the American flag. Now, of course, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. We declared war on Germany. And suddenly you can't have Stephen F. Austin doing that, so they struggle today. He's pointing the way to the future. <laughs> He's pointing the way to the capital. <laughs> and every revolution needs a Betsy Ross. So we went and dug one up in Georgia. Her name was Joanna Troutman. She did the flag for the Georgia Battalion. And we rebury her here. She never got here when she was alive, but she sleeps under a Capini statue in the Texas State Cemetery now. Now, he goes away to Chicago. He's mad at us. He can't make enough money. And then he lives in New York, but he always stays close to Texas. And as the centennial approached, we began to hire Capini again. These are the doors right close by here at the Texas of the uh, Scottish Rite Cathedral in San Antonio. He was hired over several other sculptors to do the 50 cent piece for the centennial. He did the six statues at Fair Park that are still admired. And of course, the cenotaph, the spirit of sacrifice. Beat out Guts and Borglum to the great dismay of Frank Doby, who always will call this, what, the largest grain silo in Texas or something like that. Um, but this is a good example, too. You'll notice that the well-dressed figures on the, stat on the marker today started out naked, to use the Jeff Foxworthy term. There was an argument over how to dress them. Capini, you'll notice, is not putting people in buckskins like Elizabeth Ney did, but he'll have to go 50-50 on the Alamo Monument because Dobie and his crowd, they want buckskins. So some are. What happens to him in Twilight? He stays here in San Antonio, opens up the academy that still operates today in conjunction with his longtime assistant, Waldine Taw. Now, Waldine had her own um, set of icons. She did a bunch of monuments all over Texas. If you ever flown out of Love Field, you've seen her Texas Ranger would be the easiest one to call. Um, her Moses Austin still stands here in San Antonio. But when she passes, and here's some examples. When he passes, she's the one left to carry the torch, which she will till 1986. 
Now, lest he be forgotten, Copini will write his own autobiography. It's a hoot. You should read it sometime. Talk about a man who loves himself. <laughs> but as we say back in Mississippi, if you can walk the walk, we'll let you talk the talk. Speaking of talk the talk, this is his monument right up the street from us in the cemetery. Uh, go look at it sometime. You can't miss it. The main road runs right straight at it, and in case you're not going to find it, there's a big flagpole right behind it to help you out. This is not a small monument. It's about 10 feet high. I'm going to read you his description of it, of exactly what the heck is going on here. So Capini dies in 1957. He built this in 1953. He was wanting to make sure that his legacy was remembered. So what you're looking at is, quote, three life-size figures emerged from a tripod spirit lamp with clouds of smoke ascending and forming the background. The figure of Father Time places his proper right hand over the wrist of the artist, capital A, while the artist, capital A, offers a sketch of the atom and looks up to the sky at the figures of Minerva and Gloria seeking their judgment in his claim to fame. Behind the artist is his wife, pleading with Father Time not to stop him. Above all the figures is the eye of God himself, representing the great light of Judgment Day. A modest man, yes. <laughs> Very modest. But, as we might say back home, he had reason to be proud of himself. He had reason to brag. By the way, Elizabeth is buried right next to him in the other box set, and Waldine's between the two of them the adopted daughter that stayed all of her life with him. Why would I say he has reason to brag? Because I think in many ways, Capini redefined the historic landscape of Texas. When Texans think of the Alamo, they think of Austin, they think of Houston, they think of all these figures. They quite often in their minds see the figures that Capini created as part of redefining Texas as not Southern, but Western, which I would agree was a very successful operation. So when we look around at Capini, an outsider, yes, if we're thinking of modern art, an outsider, yes, if we're thinking of where he might fit into the greater flow of artists who have come and gone in Texas. But he was not an outsider in the impact he had on Texas. He was certainly successful in his own way, in his own mind, of creating a whole new pantheon of American heroes and making sure that we did not forget that past, just like his mentor taught him long ago in the Academy at Florence. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, Rick, in case anybody uh, had any slight doubts, Rick is also working on a book on Papeo Capini, which uh, we can all look uh, forward to uh, very much when it is published. Uh, I think there's uh, kind of an oversupply of archival information, so it may be, may be a while. Jay, Ra Jay Wainert wrote the book on outsider art in Texas. It is named, naturally enough, Outsider Art in Texas, and was published last year by Texas A&M University Press. Jay is a Houston-based collector, independent curator, collaborator, and writer who has been engaged with outsider art for more than 30 years. He has named his arts endeavor Intuitive Eye. Through it, he works with artists, galleries, museums, and collectors to expand awareness and appreciation of outsider art. He has written for local and international publications such as Raw Vision and is a contributor to this Woody Museum exhibition. He will give us some takes on outside artists along with a few harrowing stories about how we almost miss knowing anything at all about some of them. Please welcome Jay Wiener. Thanks everyone for being here. And I especially wanted to thank Ron Tyler for his invitation uh, to present here and for his inclusion of outsider art in this expansive exhibition of Texas art. And really to encapsulate in that this idea that outsider art is part of Texas art and Texas art history. And I think this exhibition helps to further and advance that idea. It also was an interesting invitation for me personally to talk about 
these artists who, the two artists who I'll talk about to, today, who came from outside of Texas here to create their work and who created their work outside of the institutions and the conventions of the art world. But it also gave me a context to talk about these outsider artists in relation to their creative peers who are contained within this show, who, while they may have been more steeped in art history, the canon of art, relationships with other artists and art institutions uh, may have strived to be independent of them and apart from them, uh, and to make some of those comparisons for the outsider artists. What I'd like to begin first, though, is just by describing briefly what I'm talking about when I discuss the concepts and ideas around outsider art and talk about some of the foundational ideas. This is kind of the art history portion of my presentation. I'll be sure to keep it brief. Uh, many of the foundational ideas related to outsider art had their beginnings with the French artist and sculptor Jean Dubuffet, who as part of the French avant-garde in the 30s and 40s, in his time was railing against artists and art that was produced uh, as part of the conventional and established art world, as artists do from time to time. Uh, Dubuffet was railing against art that was produced through patronage, the, through the uh, aspirations and acclaim of the uh, public for the art. Dubuffet, in his way, was seeking art uh, through his own work and through the work of the surrealists that was more, that was grounded in what he thought of as a more authentic, and genuine form of expression and started looking for versions of that work that embodied those ideas. And where Dubuffet found that work in his explorations were in the mental asylums throughout Europe. He found work that was being created by artists who were living and working in a deep form of isolation from all of the conventions of the art world and the cultural institutions of their day. That, that degree and extent of their isolation is the idea that permeates what Dubuffet came to call art brut, the English translation of that being raw art, art that was uncooked by the establishment. The artist that Dubuffet focused most uh, on was Adolf Wolfley, who while during his time, his lifetime of institutionalization, created a massive epic body of work that was uh, in book form, uh, multi-volumes that represented an entire world that he had created full of his own languages, his own musical annotation, and that reflected this world that he was creating in the isolation of his own life and the isolation within the asylum. In the 70s, the English art critic and historian Roger Cardinal, to bring these ideas from mid-century more into the modern world, the, uh, Roger Cardinal 
in his exp exploration of Du Buffet's work with Art Brut, began writing his book for an English-speaking audience. Part of Du Buffet's uh, legacy was bound in the idea that his work was written in France uh, for a European audience. It got some attention, but not much uh, in the English-speaking art world. Uh, Roger Cardinal's book, which was meant to be his exploration of Art Brut, was titled Outsider Art. It was art, Outsider Art was a term that was meant to be synonymous with Art Brut. And Roger Cardinal's book brought that idea to an English-speaking audience. And it also served to democratize the ideas of Art Brut and Outsider Art in that the ideas became less hinged on the idea of the artist with psychiatric problems and being institutionalized and expanded the idea that forms of isolation in the extreme could take the forms of cultural isolation, ethnic and racial isolation, geography, isolation based on spiritual and other kinds of beliefs. And so these ideas began to incorporate this essential degree to which the outsider artist is not at all engaged with or influenced by art history, the canon of art, other art or art movements. The outsider artist is not informed or influenced or responsive to the art movements, the cultural institutions, or the conventions of history or their current times. Additionally, they're not aware of nor do they emulate or seek inspiration from the art world. They don't react to or rebel against the conventions or influences of culture and society. They are indeed a movement of one. What I'd like to do next is to talk about two artists included in the exhibition who really embody these ideas. The first artist who I'll talk about is Charles Delshaw. Charles Delshaw arrived in Texas from Prussia um, in, oh, double check my notes. <laughs> he, he was born in 1830 and arrived through the port of Galveston in 1850. Uh, Delshaw arrived in Texas trained as a butcher and most of his work life during the years that he was in Texas were spent doing that. Delshaw led a life of great loss and suffering, losing both of his wives and all of his natural children to disease and death. He led a very solitary life even though he was seeking domesticity. He may have spent some time in California during the gold rush, uh, but eventually returned to Houston where he took up residence late in life with his last remaining stepdaughter and her family uh, who were in the Stelzig family. Uh, Delshaw spent the last 20 years of his life in relative solitude and seclusion, uh, a very reclusive life in an upstairs room of his home, uh, creating what would later be found by Fred Washington, a Houston junk dealer, who when combing the streets of Houston, found the remnants of a fire at the family home. And what Fred Washington found and the product of Delshaw's last 20 years of his life were multiple volumes 
of bound handmade books that appear to chronicle uh, in their text Delshaw's participation in a secret society of men who lived in California, the Sonora Aero Club, who were producing lighter than air flying machines, pre Wright Brothers. The initial books that Delshaw created were very draftsman-like. Delshaw identified himself as the draftsman of the group. And they took the form of mechanical drawings in great detail, some of whose engineering predated what was uh, actual in engineering of the time. There, were, were, there was dense text that chronicled the meetings of the club, details of the group's membership, and illustrations of their activities. Now, if this, these books had been Delshaw's only uh, production, they would have been a great legacy of uh, his creativity. But at producing work at about a rate of one per day for 20 years, Delshaw's work gradually became more creative, more impressionistic, more focused on the uh, design, the creativity of the machines, and less and less like mechanical drawings. Delshaw used collage in his work that uh, referenced technical advancements of his day, which uh, represents some of his connection to the world. But his works, as the years went by, became, quote unquote, more artistic. Whether they were true or not, we're not really sure, and Delshaw left us some hints to that. The second artist that I'll talk about who also uh, came, who through his family, came to Texas from the outside, was Frank Jones. Frank Jones' family were slaves. Uh, unlike Delshaw, who's who arrived here voluntarily seeking a better life, Frank Jones' family arrived here through uh, force and violence and enslavement. Though Frank Jones, uh, was the recipient of his family's rich uh, cultural and spiritual wisdoms. Uh, Frank Jones was born with the idea given to him by his family of what was called second sight that would allow him to see into the spirit world. For Frank, that, uh, that experience in, in his life was very disturbing and unsettling. He lived, uh, in, he lived a violent and uh, very disorganized life, eventually uh, coming to be a resident of Huntsville State Prison uh, after being convicted of violent crimes. But there, Frank Jones, as an old man, began to draw, never having drawn before. And what he began to draw were what he called devil houses, structures that initially were done on found paper with the nubs of the blue and red pen, pencils that the accountants, the prison bookkeepers would use that we all had back in grade school. Uh, they were built like prisons with devils that lurked outside of them. Frank said that the devils were always smiling because they did that to lure you into their traps. Frank Jones then spent most of his days at Huntsville drawing. In 1964, Huntsville State Prison had their first prison art show. And as a joke, another discovery story, the prison guards entered Frank Jones's drawings into the art show. The art show was being judged by the art faculty of Sam Houston University, uh, one of 
uh, whom was the late Charles Pebworth. Uh, in conversation with, with Dr. Pebworth, he described how uh, expecting the usual uh, typical cliched prison art when they saw Frank Jones's art, they were amazed by its depth of complexity, its energy, uh, its attachment to his inner life. Frank Jones, like Charles Delshaw, spent the rest of his life creating his devil houses that served as, as he talked about, a protective function. They served for him to contain the evil spirits that had uh, bedeviled him throughout all of his life. Uh, they, they, they function as that protective totem uh, reminiscent of uh, African traditions as well. They became quite complex and are remarkable for their kinetic energy and how they uh, contain his spiritual world in which he lived. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay. We have uh, a fair amount of time left for uh, some questions. We're under the control of a professionally trained uh, timer here, so we, don't worry, we won't go over time. We have a question right here, Ricardo. tradition is led by drums. So drums come from Africa in 1500, and drums are used throughout black Afro music for the next 500 years. Is how does the art, when you say it's an African tradition, is this something he learned about Africa, or just something like drums that just stays for the next 500 years. There are elements of that, I think, in Frank Jones's work in that there are elements of that in Frank Jones's work, I think. Uh, my reading of, of others writing about Frank Jones is, again, that he grew up with this idea that he was the recipient of beliefs and wisdom of his culture of origin, that he was, he was told that he was born with this ability of second sight, which was attached to his, the circumstances of his birth, in which part of the placental membrane covered part of his eyes. And in, his, and in the African belief system from which his family came, that's what identified him as having second sight. And so that was an also, not only was he told that, but it was an expectation of what he would experience as a person. And so he became the conduit of those beliefs of the culture from which his family arrived here. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, where was Copini's studio here in San Antonio? And is there any remnants of that, the location? Where was it? And then the second question is, what do you see the disposition of a lot of his Confederate work, and can that be saved, or might there be a, a retrospective on that at some point in the history of art for Texas? <laughs> Let's go with the easy question first. Yes, the Capini Art Academy still functions. They hold juried shows. They teach classes. 
Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the street. Somebody knows Melrose. it, Melrose. It's on Melrose. Um, it's a fascinating place to go visit. Uh, Waldine lived upstairs for many, many years, and her apartment is largely preserved with a lot of relics of her life and his life. Um, great place to go, good place to time to go is when I first spent a lot of time there, which is during Fiesta. He was one of the guys who designed some of the early Fiesta medals and was instrumental in getting Fiesta going. Now to the tougher question. Um, I have no idea, because I'm a historian, not a prognosticator, what's going to happen with a lot of his works. Um, it's not just UT that's taken him down. They've removed one of his proudest equestrian statues was in front of the um, courthouse in Lexington, Kentucky. That was John Hunt Morgan. It's been removed. Um, others are now being targeted or discussed for removal. And it's not just us today. Um, he, his, he actually did three George Washington statues. One of the first was in Mexico City, which the revolutionaries, after they deposed Huerta, took that down and dragged it through the streets and destroyed it. So he's always been in the midst of that. It's something he discussed during his own life. But as far as my predictions on how far we're going to go with the Confederate statue arguments, I wish I knew. I, being a natural-born pessimist, I'm probably thinking we have not hit rock bottom yet. So others are going to come down. What I would like to see and I'll just take my stand so y'all know where I stand. Um, as Capini said in 1928, it's another part of the letter I didn't quote, any idiot can take something down. It takes hard work and ability to put one up. Um, I think the money spent taking them down would be well spent in putting up monuments to other people's perspectives on the history. They spent over a half million dollars and actually accidentally killed a guy taking down the Robert E. Lee statue in Dallas. Um, that half million would have made a very nice monument to maybe the civil rights movement in Dallas or whatever other story somebody wanted to tell. So keeping it short on that front, but I think there will probably be more coming down. Um, what I would like to see is the promises to display them in museums be kept, but that promise is not being fulfilled. Um, there have been several instances where museums have offered to take something and they've been refused and the pieces remain in storage somewhere. So I've probably just ticked off half the room. If I get the right question, I'll probably tick off the other half and have to run out of here. Unlike Dr. Romo, I can't say I taught Rick McCaslin, <laughs> but I can report that he was a resident of my current neighborhood in Denton known as Idiot's Hill, and he was the most brilliant person to live in Idiot's Hill, I believe. <laughs> at any rate, uh, I have always been under the impression, reading Capini's autobiography, looking at his papers, he was very, very conservative politically, and may even had, had sympathies with uh, uh, Mussolini-type fascism. My question is this. Uh, given that assumption, do you think that his political conservatism endeared him to the kind of patr uh, patronage that he got from many Texans of that era who were probably uh, uh, closer to that on the political spectrum than elsewhere in the country? So far, my research has indicated that they're looking for the best work at the best price. So we have Louis Amateus, we have all sorts, Raul Jose. We have a bunch of other artists doing the same sort of work. Um, sometimes there's the old boy network, there's hiring of family members or friends, etc. The whole game is done, as you well know, with letters of introduction and little in, um, interviews, etc. Rarely do they ever discuss politics. In fact, the people who agreed to allow him to do the John Hunt Morgan statue in Lexington were very disturbed that A, he was Catholic, and B, he was furrin and talked funny, and C, he didn't seem to be a real Confederate. Um, that bar bothered Basil Duke and some of those fellas up there. Um, he always would have to overcome those hurdles. Um, did he and Littlefield share a political viewpoint? Absolutely. Did that get him the job? I kind of doubt it because there were even times when 
Littlefield pushed him aside like the doors for Littlefield's bank. They deeply disagreed over what should be on those doors. And Littlefield, as you may remember, hired the Tiffany Company to do them. And Capini made it a point to come over and ridicule them <laughs> as soon as he had spent as much money as he did. So there were all kinds of other factors. Um, politics may have been one, but so far what I'm seeing is the politicking of getting the, the best job for the best price by as famous a guy or as well-connected a guy as you could gather. Oops. Okay, we're supposed to start on time and end on time. We have uh, pretty much done both, and we'd like to thank very much our speakers, both Rick and Jay, for coming here this afternoon.